course in organizational behavior. I'm Dr. Naomi Rotter from the School of Management at NJIT, and I hope that over the next 13 or so weeks that we have an adventurous journey into the what, where, and whys of employees in organizations, uh, understanding why they're doing the various things that they do, and why organizations engage in certain policies and practices. To kind of capture uh, the essence of organizational behavior, I'd like to relate an anecdote that happened to me this weekend to give you a full spectrum. It was Labor Day weekend. Like many people in the U.S., we were out of town on the road. Sunday morning, we got up, went to go to the car, put the key in the ignition. Nothing. I mean really nothing. It was so dead, my husband thought somebody stole the battery. We got up and we took a look in the front of the car. Battery's still there. We have never seen a car die that quickly and that completely. So what do you do when you're out of town and your battery is dead? Well, if you're a AAA member like we are, we call AAA. The mechanic comes in the tow truck, starts the car. We say, wait a minute. Don't go so fast. We want to see if it's going to work without a boost. Dead. Nothing. I'm getting kind of nervous. Fortunately, down the hill from us is a Walmart. Fortunately, open on Sunday. Fortunately, the having an automotive section to it. And fortunately, the automotive section. We think it's probably the battery. That's your first best guess. But could it be something worse in the wiring system? In which case, we don't even want to contemplate all the complications that then take place. So we get the boost, drive it to the local Walmart, park it in the parking lot, and actually leave the car running so that they can pull it into the bay and take a look at it. Go get a cup of coffee, come back in a little while and say, well, how's it going, guys? And they say, your car died in the parking lot. <laughs> and they go out to the parking lot to work on it. They try a battery. Nothing. And we think, oh boy, now we're really in trouble. And we start spinning forward. Have it towed to a Toyota dealer, rent a car, have to go up next week to the location that we are to get the car back. Lots of complications. The mechanic who's working on it, incidentally, somebody who's probably about your age, the kid who's working on it, is really angry. And he's cursing because he can't find the solution to it. He goes back to the shelf, pulls another battery off the shelf, puts it in, starts like a dream. Simple enough, the first battery he pulled off the shelf was a dud. The second one worked. What if we hadn't had somebody who cared enough and was persistent enough to try a second battery, who assumed when the first battery didn't work, that was it, there was something more complicated. Our life would have been far more complicated as well. And so if we look at this one episode and we try to understand what's happening, was it the personality of the young man who was so persistent? Was it something about the group that he worked in? that they expected things to perform well? Was it something about the culture of Walmart and wanting to give good service? Those are the kinds of issues that we're going to explore over the course of a semester to try to get a better understanding of people's behavior in the workplace with an eye towards your role ultimately as managers and helping you become more effective managers. So this is where, in one short anecdote, uh, we're going to be traveling over the course of this semester. What I hope that you'll be able to get out of this course will be, first, some observational skills. Skills that will help you see more of what's going on around you. You may enjoy being a people watcher right now, maybe not. But if you're planning to become a manager, you're certainly going to need good observational skills to see what's happening both with your employees, 
and with your superiors to get an understanding of what those forces are on behavior. I also hope that as we go through the text and explore issues in the classroom, and you bring forward some of your own experiences, that you'll gather a body of knowledge about behavior. Knowing some of the concepts, some of the theories from various areas of behavioral science to help explain some of the things that you observe. I also hope that in the process, you'll start to build some analytical and diagnostic skills so that you know which of the concepts to apply to those things that you're observing, making the match. And finally, I hope that we build some appreciations of the various forces that operate on today's organizations. Organizations operate in environments today that are far more fast moving, far more dynamic than organizations of 50 years ago or even organizations of 30 years ago or 20 years ago. I suppose the best example we can use of fast changing is to think of software that we use. No sooner do we buy one and start to become a little familiar with it than bingo, the next edition is out. And we haven't even had a chance to gain some experience from the software that we're using. And uh, we're at a point where we're saying, why so fast? Give us a chance. In fact, there are software companies out there that find that they have to support versions that were in DOS because people don't want to move so fast. They want to move a little bit slower. They get comfortable. They don't want to change. How do you make people change? in a world that requires change, and maybe they don't want to. All issues that we're going to be looking at. So if we take a working definition of what we're going to be viewing over the course of the semester in organizational behavior, we can consider it to be a field of study that uses concepts, theories and methods of an array of behavioral sciences, and we're going to be looking at those behavioral sciences, to understand the behavior of individuals and groups in organizations, and finally, apply that knowledge towards improving organizational effectiveness. So what are these various fields of study that we're going to be taking a look at? Well, organizational behavior as a discipline is relatively new. It borrowed from a lot of areas. The areas that it borrowed from include individual and social psychology, sociology, anthropology, and political science. So in a sense, its roots go back very deep, and there is a large foundation of research and information, but it comes from other disciplines. These have blended in and become applied to the area that we now call organizational behavior. If we look at the area of individual and social psychology, particularly individual psychology, we will be studying the areas of perception, of personality and attitudes, of learning, and of motivation. Let's pause for a minute and consider each of these areas. What role does perception play in trying to understand behavior in the organization? Well. How do we know anything until we sense it? It's the starting point of all knowledge, perception. And we will be spending a couple of lecture sessions on perception. We'll start out with looking at principles that govern object perception. Why do we 
select and focus on certain things? How do we organize those things that we focus on into something that makes sense? And then we'll build to social perception or perception of people. So we start with something static, and we move on to something far more dynamic. Perceiving, understanding people. And we'll see how some of the processes that affect the way we percep perceive a simple object, a pen, a book, a chair, also apply to the way that we perceive people. But then we'll also see how this perception, this area, is far more complex because people change, objects don't. And from there, we build our understanding and impressions of why people behave the way they do. So the starting point of everything. We'll see as we immerse ourselves in this area uh, a number of interesting effects. Why first impressions may become lasting impressions. Why we often focus more on negative information about people than on positive information. How we judge people in contrast to other people. Some of the things that we'll be looking at when we study perception. Another area of individual psychology that contributes is that of personality and attitudes. One of the areas that has been focused on as uh, a major complaint of people in the workplace, the bad boss. Everybody's had some working experience, and you have some familiarity of relationships with bosses. A good boss can make a job really nice. A bad boss can make it miserable. Uh, personality affecting the situation. And what about personality of your coworkers? And how does personality relate to uh, how productive you are in the workplace? And job attitudes. We'll particularly look at some attitudes of satisfaction in the workplace and how that relates to issues such as productivity, if it relates to it. Uh, as well as your willingness to come to work every day. Another area is commitment to the job. And how does that play itself out? Some people seem in the worst working conditions to have the strongest commitment and go to extraordinary lengths. Do we explain that by personality? Do we explain it by the organization? Another topic that is becoming increasingly important is that of learning in the organization. Why learning? Why does that become increasingly important? Well, I gave you a clue a little while back. That fast-changing software, the need to constantly upgrade and learn new skills in order to keep pace with what the job is becoming in the workplace. It's becoming more technical, it requires constant adaptation. But there's more to learning than simply learning the job itself. You need to learn, as they say, the ropes to climb in an organization. And you need to know which ropes to skip, if you will, in an organization. So there is an enormous amount of informal learning that goes on in an organization. Think about it, folks. Think about jobs that you've held. What are some of the informal things that you've learned about the organization? Anybody have any ideas? What about things like dress? What does your organization tolerate in the way of how you come to work? Do you need to dress in a uniform manner? In some cases, the job requires that you actually wear a uniform. Or is there wide variability on what you can wear to work? Nobody seems to care too much, as long as you don't come in slovenly. There's a lot of toleration. What about promptness? Some organizations require that you be really prompt. In fact, the job demands it. 
if you're not there. You may put people's lives in jeopardy if you're working at a hospital. Uh, you certainly could make customers really irate in other situations. Um, and if you're working shifts and your coworkers expect that you're going to show up on time so they can come home and you're showing up late, well, your coworkers may not be too happy with you either. So you learn something about promptness. But there may be other organizations where maybe it's not quite so important to be prompt as long as you get the work done during the course of a day. And maybe you can stay later. And what about this staying late? Are you expected to? Well, what about your coworkers? Suppose you see all your coworkers staying late. Let me ask a question this time and toss it out to somebody in the audience, somebody who's willing to be venturesome. How do you think you would feel walking out on time when you see all your coworkers staying late? Can we get a hand up in the audience out here? Somebody willing to venture an answer? Yeah, Perna. Um, I would. It would depend on the situation whether I came in early to um, work and worked on it all day and worked right through lunch. I mean, that would all depend on the situation whether you were there and you finished all your work and they didn't because they were doing other other things. Okay, but suppose we have a situation, as I hear is often the case out there in Seattle, at that famous software company that everybody knows who I'm talking about, that people stay till extraordinary hours, sometimes even sleeping in offices. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine. But imagine that you were in, somehow you got yourself onto this team of people who just stayed all kinds of extraordinary hours. What do you think you'd find yourself doing after a while? Staying late. Staying, staying, okay? And so we come to learn what are the conventions of the workplace. Now, chances are, if you really didn't like that, you probably wouldn't go to work in that type of organization if you weren't willing to do that. So uh, it's not as if people are necessarily being forced to do it, but organizations and employees have a way of finding each other. Something else that we'll consider also as we look at individual differences uh, in terms of people uh, within organizations. So this is learning, the informal things that you learn. And then finally, you learn in organizations who you can approach and who you might avoid. And yet another topic in the individual area, motivation. We're all amateur psychologists. We're all trying to figure out, why'd he do that? Why'd she do that? What's the motive behind it? Is that person hostile? Is that person just having a bad day? And from the employer or the organizational perspective, we want to know something about motivation as it applies to the workplace. Because people who are more motivated, presumably, should be performing better. Is there anything we can do to ratchet up that motivation? We hear of, in sports, coaches who are real motivators of teams. Anybody have any examples that come to mind of coaches that you hear out there who are really able to motivate their teams? Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight. Okay. And his teams have been perennially good teams. Indiana, I presume, right? Okay. Uh, in the New York area, we hear tell of the football coach Bill Parcells as a motivator. The season will tell, but already it looks far more promising than it did for the previous season. What difference do these people bring, and how are they able to encourage employees to perform at a level that they had not previously performed at? What is it they're doing? Is there something the way an organization itself is structured that can help people perform better? things that we'll look at. You know, we often hear complaints. Oh, the American worker compared to the Japanese worker. The American car compared to the Japanese car. But if you're not aware of it, 
one of the most popular cars that's sold in the U.S. is a Japanese car that's manufactured entirely in the U.S. and obviously employs all U.S. workers. Is it something about the organization that makes the difference? Okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Camry. Okay, made out near Lexington, Kentucky. They're American workers. Why might they be performing differently in that organization than if they were working in a comparable U.S. organization? And certainly, cars in the U.S. are far better than they were in quality several years ago. Things have changed. Um, so, you know, is it something about the organization as well as an individual manager or what a person brings to a job? We'll study all of those issues as we explore motivation. But it's not only the individual. There's more to an organization than the individual. And in some ways, we're going to start exploring organizational behavior inside out, starting with the individual and moving out. But as we move out to larger structures in the organization, we'll see how it has an effect on the individual. So first we look at how the individual has some effect in the organization. And we gradually come to understand how there is a mutual effect of the organization on the individual. So we go then to the next two areas, social psychology and sociology. Looking at the effects of groups and group processes in the organization. What is it that we come to study here? Well, the first thing I mentioned are various different types of group processes and group dynamics. How does the group influence the individual? And it doesn't have to be a real group. It can be an imaginary group, if you will, or something that we call a reference group. You may not need to know those individuals personally, although personal members of groups clearly have powerful influence on you. But you may think of yourself as being a member of some larger group, and the standards that you know about that larger group also influence you. What am I talking about? Well, individual groups, we understand. We understand how peers influence us. We understand the pressure that's put on us when three out of four of our friends want to go to one movie and we want to go to another movie. It takes a lot of energy to try to convince three other people to go to the movie we want to go to. So chances are we yield and we say, OK, go to the movie you want to go to. Yielding, conformity. We do it all the time. But what about some of these, mm, I don't want to say imaginary groups, reference groups, groups that we consider ourselves part of we may not know all the members of those groups, may not know them personally. These could be professional groups that we belong to. Professional groups set standards and ethics for us. You don't have to know all the members of that group, but you consider yourself to be a member of that group. And by being a member of that group, we're influenced by that group. You adhere to the standards of your profession. You adhere to the ethics of what your profession is. And so influence that way as well. Influence to the extent that we consider ourselves to be part of some cultural subgroup and adhere to, again, whatever those norms and standards are. And does the advertising um, sector obviously know how to hit us on that account and persuade us because we're young and we want to be a member of some generation uh, and express certain things. Look at the popularity of sports utility vehicles. 
I walk through a local parking lot, and it is full of sports utility vehicles. Okay? Incidentally, that's a parking lot where people drive four or five blocks so they can catch the commuter train into New York. Now think about it. Again, I need somebody to venture an answer. Think about commercials you've seen advertising sports utility vehicles. What do they advertise? What kind of roads are they driven on? What's the terrain? Dirt roads, Dirt roads mountains, uh, deserts, snowstorms, you name it. I don't think too many of the people who drove from their homes to the parking lot to catch the commuter train went through <coughs> sandstorms, snowstorms, torrential downpours, and rough roads. Okay, and yet there's an image of maybe belonging to that, being that kind of a person. And so you buy the kind of car that helps identify you as that kind of person. Okay, some kind of reference group influencing our own individual and personal behavior. An example, group dynamics. Within the issue of groups, we'll also look at the issue of communication. How is it that we come to understand each other in organizations? I would hazard a guess that communication can be a really large problem. An example from a class that I taught just Tuesday night, a class in organizational development, a topic that we'll hit at the end. I asked the class to write about their most recent frustrating experience at work. They wrote about it. They discussed it with each other. And then the task was to find commonalities between their frustrating experiences. The most frequent commonality that came up, that word I just mentioned, communication. People not getting information to you in timely ways. People being confusing about what they want you to do. People leaving you out of the loop altogether and then expecting somehow that you should have known about this. And think about the way we communicate to others. Are we sometimes vague? Hmm. Do we sometimes expect people to fill in the blanks? Mm-hmm. Do we often put ourselves in the shoes of the other person who's listening to us? Mm-mm. Not too often. OK. Communication. How can we make it better in organizations? Another area is that of decision making. Obviously important organizations are these entities that consist of people who make big decisions at some level of the organization and then get the rest of us to carry it out. But at lower levels, decisions have to be made too. How can effective decisions be made in organizations? And are there some things that lead us to make erroneous decisions? It's an area that we're going to again explore and even try some exercises in to see how some of the very processes that often lead us to make good decisions sometimes lead us to make really wrong decisions. Those big bloopers do organizations make mistakes? Sure. I think one of the things I'll ask you to do between now and the next class is think about some of the bloopers some organizations have made somewhere along the line. Now, what would be a big blooper in an organization? Well, yeah, you had an idea? A new Coke, new Coca-Cola. Right, exactly. New Coke did not fly. They had to pull it off the market. All the testing that they'd done ahead of time didn't seem to bear out when they actually brought it to the marketplace. So that's a very good example. Thank you. Uh, there are some others out there as well that you can think about. And you don't have to limit yourself to private organizations. Governments fall into that as well. And governments are organizations too. What we talk about when we talk about organizational behavior holds for the public as well as the private sector. So things to think about, bloopers that they've made, bad decisions.
And we will also consider leadership. Talked a little bit about it before when we asked about, I asked about coaches that seem to make a difference. Is it all in the coach? Is it a matter of personality? Is it something that you can learn? Or do you have to, if you will, be born with the characteristics? Uh, if you have to be born with the characteristics, it's going to leave a lot of people in trouble who want to aspire to leadership positions. So let's hope that there's something there to be learned besides just traits that people seem to bring to the situation. And are there certain situations in which it's easier to be a leader than other situations? And if you're fortunate enough to be in one of those situations, you really look good. What about being a leader in good economic times? The president of a country, the governor of a state, the mayor of a city, when things are booming. How does that leader look? Looks good. Okay? We attribute to that leader a lot of things that are going on that may not even be directly the responsibility of that leader. The leader had maybe not much to do with that at all. But by virtue of being in that position, we credit things. Now, the downside of that is the leader who has the misfortune to be in a position during an economic downturn. Because if you get the credit when things are good, you also get the blame when things go sour. So we can look at, then, leaders and situations. Is there some way leaders can maybe shape situations to make it easier for them to lead? Do we need to match leaders to situations? And where do women fit in as leaders? We certainly have women rising to a lot of positions of power. But we also hear the term glass ceiling. It's as if maybe there's a barrier. And we call it glass because it's invisible. Nobody ever tells you in the organization, that's as far as we're going to let you go. But maybe there is an invisible barrier there. By virtue of the culture of the organization, the norms of the organization, or whatever, which people really aren't cognizant of, except for those who bump up against it and say, how come I can't seem to get any further in this organization? So a lot of things we need to talk about in terms of leadership. Uh, and another thing I alluded to before, the bad boss problem, how much does that contribute to economic losses in the society by way of poor productivity and poor worker morale? Another aspect to be considered. And then finally, we move to the area of sociology, anthropology, polity, and political science. What does that contribute? Well, there we look at the effect of no longer groups, but some things that seem to be attached to this amorphous thing we call the organization. You know, what is an organization in the end without people in it that make it operate? And yet it goes on beyond the people. People come and people go, and the organization endures. It is a structure in its own. So we look at the actually something we call the structure of an organization. Does it matter how units are linked to each other? Does it matter how many layers of hierarchy they are in an organization in terms of the impact on the individual? And what about how formalized an organization is versus its informality? Another aspect that we need to consider when we look at organizational behavior. We will also, as we look at that, look at the environment in which 
organizations operate? Is it complex? Are there a lot of external entities, units, regulators that they have to deal with? Is it fast changing? Is it slower changing? Because this has an effect ultimately on the individuals in the organization. We'll study something called culture of an organization. The same way that a society has a culture and subgroups within societies have cultures, we've come to understand that organizations have cultures as well. And these cultures, again, exert pressures on individuals in the organization. We do things this way in XYZ Corporation. It's part of corporate culture. It exists. As new people come in, they learn to do things the way XYZ Corporation wants them to be done. Why do they do it that way? It's something that we're going to find out. Sometimes it's just because some president, maybe, of the corporation did it that way and set the standard for all time to come. And people don't want to vary from it because this person was such a looming presence in the organization. And we may see, again, the rise of personality in CEOs of organizations, some of whom are reaching, well, if not star status, and in some cases it is star status, close to star status. The name Bill Gates is known, is widely in the US, I suppose, is the name Tom Cruise. <laughs> okay. We see this large looming personality over the organization. And there are probably some other organizations that come to mind too. If I say Apple Computer, what name comes to mind? Anybody? Is the name Steve Jobs ring a bell with you? Okay. Uh, a, f a founder of it dropped out for a while, did some other things, and came back and is exerting his presence again. And we can talk about some owners of teams. A George Steinbrenner, well known. Probably better known than some of his managers. Or a Donald Trump another, these, these looming personalities that have effect on the actual culture of the organization, and it perpetuates. Some other things that we'll also take a look at as we study organizations will also deal with how organizations develop and change over time. A necessary factor. Organizations can't stand still. They can't stand still because the competition isn't standing still. So they do need to change. And so we're going to take a look at that. And then finally, where do we wind up with, with organizations as we're on the threshold of entering the 21st century, particularly as organizations go global? So there we've taken a look at the what we're going to be studying over the course of the semester. The balance of the time that we have here will take a look at how we study behavior and what some of the key influences have been on organizational behavior. A very brief history to what is going on. Some of the early impact, before there even was a field of organizational behavior, came from the industrial engineering studies that happened in the early part of the century, particularly those of Frederick Taylor, who was in a way local since he graduated from Stevens, and Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, who were definitely local to the New Jersey area. They lived in Montclair, New Jersey. We'll take a look at Hawthorne studies, so named because they took place in Hawthorne, Illinois, at the Western Electric Plant. And finally, we'll look at some of the recent challenges for organizational behavior. <laughs>
Frederick Taylor. What did he contribute? He will forever be associated with the terminology scientific management. His particular contribution dealt with steelworkers at Bethlehem Steel out in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He was looking at the way manual laborers shoveled iron ore and decided that the job could be changed by changing the tools they were working with. You give a manual laborer a bigger shovel, that laborer can shovel more ore per hour. But he also believed <coughs> that there should be a link between how much a worker works and how much a worker is paid. He tried to bring in time and motion studies, which persist today. He tried, he actually did bring in time and motion studies. And so he was able to look at how much workers were working per hour or per minute. Uh, the amount of ore that they were shoveling and make certain measurements and then determine what would be the appropriate size shovel. You don't want to give somebody too big a shovel because it's going to strain them. Again, using physical measurements, okay? Um, and so he determined what was the appropriate size, bringing time and motion then into the study of how much work somebody can do per hour. These studies continue to exist today, as I mentioned before. Uh, Frederick Taylor, unfortunately, also is sometimes see, seen in a light that is not so popular in organizational behavior. Because what happened, unfortunately, out at Bethlehem Steel among these workers is the fact that when management saw workers could produce more, well, they at first were inclined to pay them more but then they were not inclined to pay them more. And so workers came to distrust this whole notion of time and motion studies. Just another management tool to get more work out of the worker without treating the worker fairly in terms of compensation. In fact, it did happen. Not necessarily Taylor's fault, but his tools, unfortunately, became used to that end. But we saw then the effect that the design of tools can have on people's productivity. And we look at tool design and task design today. The Gilbreths also looked at the work that people were doing and had impact in two areas. They designed, redesigned, I should say, the bricklayers' work because they saw the bricklayers at the time seemed to be making an awful lot of unnecessary movements and so constructed uh, a way of organizing the work, putting the bricks in a certain location to where the, and other things that the bricklayer needed so that the bricklayer could work much faster. But another very interesting area they got involved in is the hospital operating room. I don't know if anybody has seen the inside of an operating room lately. I've had that benefit. What you see inside is operating room. The people that you see inside there is the surgeon who's going to operate on you, the anesthesiologist, and a host of operating room nurses. Everybody truly works as a team there. If you're trying to think of a true team at work, it's the team, the surgical team, that's engaged in an operation. People have roles that are specific, uh, but dependent and related to other people's roles. One of the roles, I believe, is the role of a nurse who specifically hands the surgical tools to the surgeon, scalpel, knife, We've seen it in movies. But the operating room was not always that way. There was a time when the surgeon, it's going back a few years, had to look for his, probably not her at the time, more likely his, uh, own surgical tools. Now imagine what surgery would be like. You need every second you can. You don't want to waste any time at all. And imagine the surgeon taking time to say, oh, where is that knife I wanted to use? Where's that scalpel? Terrible way 
to design the workplace. Terrible use of the surgeon's time looking for implements and maybe even picking up the wrong one. So they redesigned it and assigned the task specially to one person who would be handing the tools and that way the surgeon never has to take an eye off what's going on in surgery. Much better way of doing the job. So we understand then that we can design jobs so that they're done more effectively and we better utilize people's talents and we don't waste people's talents in doing the job. The Hawthorne studies took place at the Western Electric Plant in Hawthorne, Illinois. The Western Electric Company is now pretty much defunct, but it was at one time an independent company producing electrical equipment and then later became a wholly owned subsidiary of AT&T and produced all the telephones and wires and everything else that needed production at the time. When it was in that state, being a wholly owned subsidiary of AT&T, industrial engineers from MIT were called out to do some studies to see if there was anything that could be done to improve productivity at this plant. And they started to do the typical industrial engineering studies. They looked at the effect of lighting. They looked at the effect of heat. They looked at the effect of rest breaks on people's productivity. But they began to find something interesting. They were good scientists. They not only looked at the group where they were changing heating and lighting and rest breaks, they used a comparison group as well. And so they examined what happened with this comparison group where things weren't being done. And they began to get some interesting effects and began to see that this group that they had assembled to study began to show positive effects as they increased lighting, for example, or gave them more rest breaks. But being also good scientists, they said, well, let's see what happens if we start to decrease lighting and maybe take away some rest breaks. They were surprised because regardless of what they did, increase lighting, decrease lighting, productivity stayed up. And they said, we've got something operating here beyond the mere effect of the physical work environment on the worker. We have, if you will, some psychological processes operating. We have to account for this by something else. Today we use the term Hawthorne effect derived from those studies to tell us something about the role of what we call expectations on workers' behavior. Interesting effect. Expectations. These people thought they were selected, not randomly, but for some special reason. Maybe they were the cream of the crop. And they performed then in accordance with their own expectations. Interesting effect, the Hawthorne effect. So we see then that there is then early understanding about the 1930s that people's own psychological processes affect what's going on. They did some other studies there as well. And those studies included examining the effect of the work group on the individual because they began to see that people who tended to produce more than the rest of the work group were subjected to certain sanctions to bring them back into line with everybody else. Nobody liked a rate buster. And so they began to again see the effect, social psychological effect of norms on productivity in the workplace. More recently, we are looking at a number of challenges that kind of steer us in the area of where organizational behavior is going. Those challenges include global competition and the need to understand different cultures. What happens if you today, in a job in New Jersey, are suddenly flown 
to South Korea. You need to know that culture in order to operate effectively. And we also need to know how to remain competitive in this fast-changing workplace. Are there changes we can make in the workplace? Are there things that we can do with our employees using everything we've talked about to help us stay more competitive? And what about the ethical challenges that we face in a workplace? In trying to remain competitive, do we cut corners? Is that OK? Or do we need to really think about long-range consequences of our behavior on the society and the environment? Uh, can we dump various uh, wastes from manufacturing and hope to get away with it? What's going to be the long-range effect of some of those things, some ethical issues that get involved in the workplace? And the last challenge that kind of steers the field of organizational behavior is this large topic that we call diversity in the workplace. The workplace no longer looks like the way it did 30 years ago because of a number of changes that are going on. More women are working. We have more, if you will, minority groups involved. Or just, I should really like to use the word different cultural groups involved in the workplace. And so people need to understand these differences, build on these differences, and communicate across these differences. So those are things that are being studied as well. And how is it that we come to study all of these things? We study them using different research designs. We use experimental designs in which we do laboratory studies. And we take the situation away from the everyday workplace to study it in a more controlled setting. And we systematically vary one factor and look at how it might affect some aspect of workers' behavior, their satisfaction, their productivity. But we're isolating the situation from a lot of pressures that exist in the workplace. Sometimes we actually try to carry these studies out in the workplace. An example might be, how does participation affect worker productivity? If we allow workers to participate more, are they ultimately going to become more productive than workers who we don't allow to participate at all? An experimental study, comparing one group to another. Or we use survey designs and correlational designs. We study two factors at a time and see how they relate to each other. Does worker satisfaction relate to worker turnover? Or we do surveys. Just let's see how satisfied our workers are in the workplace. Or we use case studies. We intensively investigate one organization. We lose something in the ability to generalize. Or we use focus groups. Again, trying to find out something about uh, how people think about a situation, used extensively these days, particularly um, as we try to understand people's impressions about products uh, and product design, uh, and then hope that we can generalize from that. As we come to a wrap on all of this, we want to say, OK, we've got all this research out there. How do we know this research is any good? I'm going to ask you, although I've asked you not to wear caps in here, in a sense to wear your imaginary skeptic's cap and maybe even be a little bit cynical. Always challenge when you're reading something. How does somebody know that? And the two questions we always ask about research is, does it have internal validity? Can we be confident that the outcome is related to the factor being manipulated? Or might it be due to some unmeasured factor 
a la the Hawthorne effect. They didn't know they were studying expectation effects. They thought their original results were due to lighting changes, but it wasn't. Is some other factor operating? And does the study have external validity? Can we generalize the findings of our study to a larger population? Or is the study so restricted that the findings relate only to a specific group? We need to always, over the course of the semester, and I think in other areas of life as well, challenge and be skeptical. Ask, how do you know that? Ask why. Never be afraid to ask that. Demand evidence when you hear people make assertions. The starting point for discovering what is fact and what is not fact, what is opinion, and what is evidence. And so, during this past hour or so, we started out with looking at a capsule of what organizational behavior is. We kind of, in summary fashion, went through looking at various areas of individual and social psychology in their contributions through individual psychological processes such as perception and learning and motivation and group processes including communication, decision making and leadership and some organizational factors such as how an organization is structured and its culture. And we've wound up taking a look at some historical factors and the briefest of introductions into research. All of this as a background for where we are going to be going next time as we study the field of object and person perception. And as we delve into that area, we will see some of the principles that govern the way we organize our perceptual inputs, that sensory stimulation that comes to us. And then we will look at how we apply this to perceiving people. First impressions, do they always become lasting impressions? Can we escape the first impressions people have of us? Do people develop generalizations about us? And why do we put so much emphasis on those negative tidbits that we hear about people as opposed to all the positive things? How come we hang on to the negatives? Those are the issues that we tackle during our next session in organizational behavior.